the Truth in Us Art, your source for conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community, where we talk to artists, creative thinkers, makers, and cultural leaders. I am your host, Rob Lee. Today, I've got a special episode for you. As you may know, uh, this month is National Craft Month, which is an annual celebration of creativity and crafting that takes place every March. Since it's Craft Month, I have a conversation about craft specifically the American Craft Council and the American Craft Made Baltimore Marketplace. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome two guests. Please welcome Executive Director of the American Craft Council, Andrea Speck, and Baltimore-based ceramic artist, Whitney Simpkins. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you both for coming on. Um, and it's... Um, this is kind of like, I think, maybe the third year that I've worked with the ACC. It's fun. It's fun to say ACC. So um, I feel like I'm moving up the ladder. It's just like getting great people, but then getting other great people. And then like different titles are popping up. I see ceramics. So let's let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, so what, what I always try to open the, the podcast with, because I think there's a lot of power in it, is giving the guests the space to, to introduce themselves. And I do that. Because, you know, we have these artist statements, we have these bios that are online, and it's like, something's always missing. Like, I, I've, I've talked to people, and I'm like, an artist, and basketball, it's all of these different things. It's like, you forgot I'm a boxer as well, bro. I'm like, wow. So I allow the guests to do it. So um, can we go from uh, Whitney first? Can, we, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Whitney Simpkins. Um, I am a Baltimore-based ceramicist. I've been doing it for, because I always get asked this, how long have you been doing this? Um, for about eight years now. And yeah, um, another thing that I like to do that's not usually in the bio, I guess, is baking. I really love to bake. Um, it has some of the same kind of like scientific alchemy as ceramics and pottery kind of overlaps so yeah okay so Andre. well hello uh thanks again for having us on your podcast uh so like whitney i'm part of the baking caucus and I th <laughs> whitney i think we're meeting for the first time on this podcast so i'm really looking yes. forward to seeing you uh, irl at the um Baltimore Convention Center coming up here quickly, but um, it's fun to already know that we have this in common, uh, not only the kind of craft, again, that that people will be able to see uh, at the Baltimore Convention Center uh, when we're there with the show, but baking. So I have been uh, doing my line of work, which is nonprofit uh, management and leadership for, I, I hate to say it, but like almost 25 years. Um, I just hate to say it because it's hard to believe it's been that long. But uh, before getting into that line of work and and now doing uh, nonprofit management at the American Craft Council, I am trained as an artist myself. So uh, my undergraduate uh, degree is in studio art. I was uh, a maker for I mean, throughout my childhood, I know, I think, Rob, some of your questions deal with influences and, and all of that. And so I've really been thinking about that. I mean, just the important role that learning to make art and finding my community through the visual arts, uh, how important that was to me growing up. And then, you know, again, through college and young adult years. So this work that I'm doing at the American Craft Council really brings brings a lot of different parts of my life together. Thank you. That's that's great. And We'll, we'll we'll stay with you with, with this next question because um, I, I want to learn a little bit about the because you know, when you start talking about roles you're up there so talk a bit about like the mission of the American Craft Council and like what is it that resonated with you that this was going to be the next like you know space and next opportunity that you were going to work with in because in doing the research like your name pops up so often about these great huge changes I was looking at a YouTube video again yesterday and I was just saying all right am I qualified to have this conversation so oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> so like that just makes me laugh I have to say because I, I I actually feel the other way around like am I cool enough to be on a podcast but um anyway so let's see well the first thing i want to say about the mission of the american craft council is that i think what's compelling about it i mean to me and i hope to a lot of other people is that we're, we're really working to help working artists so working artists and makers 
make a living from their work. Uh, and to me, you know, that's a very compelling thing in itself. The other part of what we do is that we're working to help build a large audience, a large and appreciative audience of, you know, fellow people, right? Fellow Americans, people in the United States who want to support the work of people who make things by hand and artists in particular, craft artists, because when you think about it, it's very difficult to make a living as an artist if you don't have a diverse, you know, younger generations as well as, right, established generations who appreciate what you do and who are willing to, you know, choose to, for example, purchase things that you're making as opposed to purchasing a mass produced alternative. So we're, we're really trying to work on both sides of that. I mean, directly supporting artists and makers through professional development and by producing events like the Baltimore Marketplace, and then through our publishing and storytelling work, and the events also really working to build that audience for artists and makers. And I'm, again, as a person who is trained myself as an artist and has always found my community in the arts and through the arts, uh, I just feel very, you know, passionately and, and it's it's personal to me to, to help artists, you know, find their way in the world, find community and be able to make a living from the work that they make. That's, a, that's huge. It, it's important. And, you know, as a person who's an appreciator, who I dabble, um, but I have these conversations and, you know, have attended, um, you know, the last, I think at least the last two here, the Baltimore marketplace and my partner, she, she went there, she's got a few pieces and I may be slid. I had this, this running bit where I'll buy stuff directly in front of her. That's a gift. And she'll see it like six months later. She's like, when did you get that? I was like, Oh, the Baltimore marketplace. And I, I'll say that she, I remember she, she went by, it was, it was one of these makers that had, like she's really into the kawaii stuff and it was a mm -hmm. uh, it's like a ring that she has that has a peppermint that's like lacquered and every city we go to she has it on and like where did you get that and it's almost like she's doing a commercial you gotta go I, to the marketplace. i have to tell you rob i know the artist and i have her work myself and it is amazing work yes it's, it's definitely a statement piece and being able to connect with some of the folks and, you know, whenever there's the opportunity to, to do these sorts of conversations, um, it, it's, it's important um, to, to, to keep it going because I think, you know, these, these conversations and highlight it because I think, you know, for me, I'm very curious about like culture and cultural preservation mm -hmm. and the, the point you were making a moment ago about sort of these mass pr produced things. It, it's a different feeling when you're able to talk with the maker and like, oh, you did this. You you made this. Tell me more about it. You're getting some of the story with it. And I, I guess that's very, very reticent. I guess that's very important. I agree. That's it is really important. And it's I think one of the things that events are particularly good for, you know, we're, we're all familiar now with the opportunity to buy all kinds of things on, online, including the handcrafted. And there are a lot of craft artists who who do amazing marketing again and, and are able to advance their careers through online sales. And I think it's particularly true, again, of younger generations. People are comfortable buying things online. But what you don't necessarily get online as much, right, is the opportunity to interact directly with artists and makers, hear the stories, get to know who that person is, what their path has been. And it makes the the thing that you're then going to live with, you know, so much more meaningful, I think. Yeah. And, and as a person who's very selective of what's in one's home, if I'm there and I'm able to really experience the item, experience what was being made, you know, I can see it online. It's great. And whenever I go to, you know, any of any any marketplaces, any cons, I go there with like a bunch of money, like in my pockets, like, look, I'm buying stuff. <laughs> this is the plan. This is intentional. But also it's definitely the connection thing because I, I do this as well. And if I'm able to talk to someone and I am getting like a really cool conversation, not only am I going to buy something, but I'm like, hey, let's do the community thing. Let's do this connection thing. Let's do this Baltimore artist conversation thing, which is a little bit of a segue to Whitney. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Whitney, if, if you will, could you share a bit of your journey into ceramics? Because I, I read somewhere that it evolved as a, a hobby until like best uh, personal best ceramics. Like talk a bit about that sort of evolution and any of the highlights on that journey. Well, I started throwing 
when I, um, throwing on the potter's wheel, when I was in middle school, I learned how to just through a community class, um, just exactly like the type of classes that I've taught in the past. Um, and I was really into it for, for that time. And then I went to art high school and I went to art college at MICA and I, I majored in painting, um, which I loved, but I didn't circle back around to ceramics until um, about eight or nine years ago. So um, let's see. And right after I got back into ceramics, I joined the Potter's Guild and of Baltimore, which is the Potter's Guild of Baltimore is just really like kind of paramount and pushing me to um, like e explore and expand my um, ceramic practice. Um, and I still belong to the Potter's Guild, but I have my own studio now. But the people at the Potter's Guild were just really, they're really inspiring and supportive and it's kind of like a little family. And um, it also taught me logistically how a studio is run. So now my studio that I have, um, I have a lot of good insight about, about what works with things. Um, so yeah, I, I started out just making things for myself, giving things as gifts, giving things um, as gifts, whether people kind of wanted them or not. <laughs> and then they got things, they got better and better. And people started to say, well, maybe you should sell this. And I started to say, maybe you're right. Um, I did a couple of markets and that face-to-face -face connection that you both were talking about was, it felt great. It was there. People were seeing me and um, a little bit validating. So I just kept going and I just kept growing from there. That's great. It's great. And um, yeah, I have, I have a follow up to that, actually, because uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I go through and I, I look at these different questions. And, you know, as I was you know mentioning in a moment, when something sparks my curiosity, it eventually turns into a question. Both of you know more than I do. I just sit here with a microphone. That's all I'm doing. I got to, you know. <laughs> So yeah, I, I see that there is a bit of whimsy, there's a bit of play that that's in your work. So, so talk a bit about the importance of play, of exploration, um, and just, as they say, you mess around, you find out. Well, the whole concept of making something from clay is you start with squishing it around in your hands, right? Whether the squishing is just messing around and pinching, or it's super intentional, like wedging a piece of clay and putting it on the potter's wheel and throwing a bowl. Um, you start by playing around um, with the, with the um, material itself. So from that, and because clay is so versatile, um, so from that, there's lots of different decisions that you make along the way, and you can decide for things to be really straight up and down, um, really neutral, or you can decide to just go ham and go all out <laughs> and um, make kind of the wildest, your wildest dreams decisions. And to me, it's like, what sounds more fun, right? So I, I like to, and from my painting, from my painting background, I kind of like to um, focus on surface design a lot and surface decoration. So my forms are pretty straightforward, usually um, a typical mug shape, a typical bowl shape, base shape. But what I really like to play with um, and where like the alchemy and the glaze mixing comes in is um, all of the patterns and designs that you can get from from surface technique. I just think it's really cool. And it's just, it, there's infinite possibilities, which I think is really fun. It's great. And, and play is important. It, you, you, like, you reminded me of the last time I did this, this sort of um, team building thing with the day job. And um, it, me and my, my peers, we went to a, um, 
it was it was a pottery place in uh, in, in the in Baltimore City. And, you know, we were going in there as a team building thing. It was like getting together and, you know, the bowls are already kind of mostly done, but it was like, hey, you guys are going to paint this. You're going to do this. You're going to make this your, your own. And so I left out with very, just two colors, nothing big, you know, but mm -hmm. left out with a, a bowl and a shot glass. And I I think I've had both of those items. Actually, one was a gift for my partner because like she always gets something. But that bowl has a certain degree of uh, reverence because it's like you you I didn't make it, but it's like you worked on it. This is something your hands were involved in. And I even go back to thinking about sort of the the local like stuff here. And this ties to this next question. Um, I remember going to it was a fundraiser years and years ago at um, this, this uh, fundraiser for for empty bowls. And it was the, mm -hmm. you know, and you you auction off these bowls. And I remember buying bowls that were made by people that were there and I had these bowls for years. It was like, this is my cereal bowl and this is my chili bowl. It's like both of them have specific, and then you don't cross the streams, it's Ghostbusters, you don't cross yeah. the streams. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it was just something about sort of the, you know, it, I don't know if maybe it's corny, but it's like I felt like love or, or something that went into it, went into that being made and sort of the memory or, and, and all of that stuff atta attached to both. Exactly. Of those. Can I. So here's what I'm thinking as you say that, Rob, um, again, going back to what makes the handcrafted special, again, why people might choose it uh, over a mass produced alternative. It does sound a little hokey, but I think that there's a soul in objects that are made with great intention and great care by a human being. And that is, these objects have souls in ways, again, that um, mass produced things simply do not. And I think that's what I'm hearing you say when you're talking about the bowl that you eat the cereal in, you know, the bowl for the chili. Yeah. Was that a little Shintoism there I was hearing? <laughs> <laughs> Might be like one bowl has a chili soul and one bowl has a cereal soul. There you go. I thought you were going to hear chili soul and chili, well, chili soul and cereal soul on this podcast. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit specifically to, you know, the marketplace coming up. So, um, could in, in, in both all of these questions that are remaining, they're like sort of back and forth there for, for both of you, um, just getting your insights on it. Um, how do you envision the, you know, the American craft made Baltimore marketplace contributing to like sort of the, the local scene here, whether it be from the makers, the marketing, the, 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 the you know, the artists, like how does it, you know, impact the community? Because I, I see it here. It's, you know, doing great things. I see a lot of people there and I, I feel like an energy there. But I just want to hear like sort of, you know, both of your insights as someone on one side of it and someone who's an artist that's that's attending and, and having worked there. Do you have in mind whether you'd like Whitney or me to jump in first on that? Uh, you you can go first. Whitney, I, I was just yeah, you can go that Whitney initially. No, you can go first because you're 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 very involved, <laughs> and I'm I'm involved in a different way, right? I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm going to be really interested to hear if you know how much Whitney Whitney will keep me honest, maybe on some of these things. I mean, so from my perspective, because I don't live in Baltimore. I do love Baltimore, and I'm not just saying that. It's been one of the joys for me in coming to work at the American Craft Council is getting to know this city. I had never been to Baltimore before taking this job and, you know, being part of, of our work to produce the show there. And by the way, this American Craft Made uh, Marketplace in Baltimore, we're doing it for the 47th time this year. So, I mean, this is a generational, this is a multi-generational uh you know, a legacy here in Baltimore with this particular event. And so in, when I think about how it has meaning for the city of Baltimore itself and how it advances Baltimore makers and artists and the city overall, I think of a couple of things. Um, one is that you talked about kind of the energy and the vibe. So this is an event that brings people together and people do come from all over. I mean, they come from all over the region. They come from all over the country, both the artists and people coming in to appreciate uh, and interact with artists. But of course, it has a particularly strong draw for Baltimore and communities right around Baltimore. So I think it becomes a kind of a, you know, just a great gathering of people who love the handcrafted and want to celebrate that and see, you know, kind of who's out there, what, what are people making? So, you know, like, I mean, a lot of events do that, right. Bring people together, uh, 
create a sense of community in that way. But this is an event that is bringing people together who have this particular interest and passion in the handcrafted. So I think there's just a great energy around that. There's a feeling, again, of, of a sense of community, um, appreciating this together. And I think the makers and appreciators, you know, we all are appreciators, right? I think if people are making things, they appreciate them as well. So there's that. I think it's an opportunity for Baltimore-based artists and makers to, yes, see one another and see the work of other Baltimore artists and makers, but it's also a chance for people based in Baltimore, again, to see the work that others are doing who are coming into town to be part of this show. It, it's almost like a crossroads in a way of, of artists and makers from all over the country. And that's inspiring and exciting for people to see work that, you know, they may not see on a typical weekend, right? Like in their own, it, through open studios and other things, I think communities, you know, we tend to know who's kind of out there in our own community and what people are making, but we don't necessarily as often have the chance to see what people are doing in other regions. So this event, you know, like I said, it's it's that I, true idea of a marketplace or a crossroads, a coming together of, people from a lot of different making traditions, a lot of regions. And I just think that's really stimulating and exciting uh, for local artists and makers too. And maybe the other thing I'll point out that is something I wouldn't have thought about until I had a conversation with somebody working at the Baltimore Museum of Art is just the legacy of this show. It, having, again, this show has now existed for close to 50 years in Baltimore. And what this curator told me was that as a result of this event being in Baltimore and the generations, again, of people who have come to appreciate the handcrafted and who have purchased things from this show and then ultimately, in some cases, donated those items as parts of collections to the Baltimore Museum of Art to, again, their collection of decorative art and craft that actually has resulted in an even stronger collection at th this, you know, again, beautiful museum based in Baltimore, uh, you know, a stronger, maybe more diverse collection than would have otherwise existed because of the ACC show or marketplace being in Baltimore. So I just thought that was a really fascinating thing to hear about the impact, again, of 50 years of this event, close to 50 years taking place in Baltimore. That would have never occurred to me. Wow. Thank you. That that is uh, that is that is great. I think it it really brings you know, and definitely Whitney. I want to get your 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 insights, but definitely it gives the it gives, but it, it gives the that extra context that I think a lot of folks like you know you you do those searches on like famous things about a given city, famous things about a given town. I didn't know it's been nearly 50 years, you know, I'm feeling quasi ignorant in saying that, but I didn't know it's been nearly 50 years and seeing that that's been a part of it. And when you ask folks like about artists, about makers, you hear like, you know, this is generational. When you hear this is, you know, half a century nearly, it's mm -hmm. like, you no, know, that's embedded in the, the, the culture that's here, this sort of making DIY culture, all of that stuff is kind of sitting there and often is, is overshadowed, which you know, that just that notion of the creative economy that's here is overshadowed. And I think, you know, that is right up my alley for what I want to achieve in doing this podcast. So thank you for sharing that. So when I first moved here to go to Micah, that's about 20 years ago now, um, I went to uh, an American Craft Council show for the first time. I took the light rail down there. I, I still take the light rail down there when I'm not exhibiting. And um I was like, this is, this is amazing. This is, I, I bet every city has this, right? The, why would it just be here? And then um, I later on learned that it's, it's, it's us. We, we're one of the um, few places that gets to have something this special and enormous and um, really just all encapsulating of all different types of craft, uh, which is really exciting. And just as a person who's um, who's taking the light rail there and paying for a ticket and coming in, what has always struck me is getting to see so many artists um, of disciplines that I didn't even really know existed. 
um, and then went home to learn more about, say, like broom making. There's like a there'll be people who make specifically just brooms, and then there's um, bespoke shoes. People who are cobblers still in the 21st century. Um, just all of these disciplines that you don't really think are still alive and well, and they are, and they're all in one place. Um, another thing that strikes me when I walk through, because I like to zigzag through every single aisle so I don't miss anything, um, I like to see where everybody's from. And I say like, wow, this person came so far. Um, I'm going to take I'm going to take a look, right? So if somebody, I see that they're from Portland, Oregon, oh yeah, I'm going to take a look because maybe I want something from them because I don't want them to ship it. I want to get it right now. Um, doesn't mean I ignore the people from Baltimore, Philly, the surrounding areas, but um, it is exciting to know if people come from so far, like they, um, maybe they've got something super special to offer. So I like to look, I like to look at everything and um, what, like what you were saying before, just have those conversations with the artist mm -hmm. that you can't really get that experience online um, just through online shopping and all that, which you can do a lot through online shopping, but you can't ask the artists about what they're, what earrings they're wearing. And then they point to a booth that's two rows over and say, I got it from that person. So um, there's a lot of connectivity like that, that I just is really, uh, really amazing. Yeah. And, you know, the, the camaraderie and, and thank you, the, the camaraderie that is there again, you know, when, you know, I was there being, you know, a spy and trying to do, do the mystery shop <laughs> while I was there, but also doing, doing the connection. It's just like putting on different hats at, at that time. And, you know, also in, in doing any of these, these cons or any of these marketplace, any of these, you know, opportunities to be in different communities, it's like one, I'm going to know a bunch of people there. And it's, it's always like going over there to connect and, you know, it's like, look, is there, if there's anything that I can do and I find it sort of those markets and, 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 you know, like, like the marketplace, when you're talking with someone, people are down to connect and collab and figure out how to work together. And it is this sense that we're all on a very similar level, we're all doing different things. And even going back to it, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, Whitney, the, the, the cobbler, right? And, you know, you have conversations with people and it's like, do you know how shoes are made? You know what I mean? And <laughs> being able to have like, oh, this is a thing that someone is still doing and carrying on in this sort of traditional way or updating it or whatever it may be, but it's not just shoes just come in a box. That's how you get shoes. It's like, no, someone had to make these somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even a broom. I'm not even, that's why I was like, you know, I was a little gobsmacked. I had to make sure because I realized I'm on camera. I was like, brooms, hold up, run that back. <laughs> Things just, exist. <laughs> they're just here. Like, how, how does a podcast made? Uh -huh. But I, I think that's, that's sort of the importance of it. And again, I think being here, being in the city, um, especially like, you know, downtown where it's at. And, you know, it's a lot of things that, that happen in that part of the city, but I think it is a good microcosm of, of what the city has. Like we have the, you have the, you know, the stadiums there, it's easy to get to via light rail I'm on a light rail too. Um, it's uh, near, you know, near the inner harbors, all of these, these different things to get sort of that, that dose as someone coming to visit, you know, even if they're semi-local or coming from, um, further away, um, and this is a question that you guys don't have, but I definitely want to ask it since we're kind of talking about Baltimore and its connection to the ACC. And can I say one other thing before you do, Rob? There's one other thing I feel like it's so important. So I just want to wedge this in before we move to that next question. Um, the other thing I think is so important to think about is that we have a lot of young people come through the marketplace. And I've had a number of people tell me, and you know, like it will bring tears to my eyes, truly. I think I'm going to hold it together right now. But when, when somebody is telling me this themselves directly and I'm he hearing the story, it's really moving to hear people say things like, you know, my parents used to take me to this show, this marketplace. And, and until I came to this, like, I really didn't understand that it was even possible, you know, to make a living as an artist, for example, like nobody in my family is an artist, you know, whatever else I didn't, really understand that this could be an option for me until I experienced this in person and saw these artists here 
And, you know, I heard that from a number of people. And that to me is a huge impact, right, of having something like this in the community, because it does provide that example uh, for people who can be at that time in their lives where, you know, they, they might know they have an interest in art and they may, they may love it, but they may not realize that, yes, it's not easy, you know, again, but there are people who do make a living, you know, from what they make. And it's a great example of that. Yes. Wow. You know, in, in doing this and most of the interviews are here in, in cities that I think are very similar, it, it's, it's a through line. I, I have I hear those those things. I have those conversations. I may have been told that at one point when I thought I was going to be a comic artist or mm -hmm. thought I was going to do this or that and chose sort of a different path. But you know, and it's almost like the trajectory of you you start something earlier, I think, as you were saying earlier, Whitney, where it's like you, you were interested in ceramics and then kind of went to, you know, like the painting and and but you eventually came back. It was kind of mm -hmm. that like, you know, I did the business stuff, but I started off, you know, trying to like figure it out, make it on my own, do a comic completely on my own, every piece of it. And um, and then did the whole business thing for a while. And upon doing this podcast for 700 plus episodes at this point, was able to revisit doing comics because it was something about it, but also kind of hearing this, I don't know if there's money in it. I don't know if it's something that you can do, but it's just like, I'll figure that stuff out. The doing is the part of it. The love of doing it is the part of it. And I think that's something that a lot of people who are makers and maker adjacent, I guess, um, are, 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 are doing. That's what drives it. So I got two, I got two more real questions. Um, and then I got those rapid fire questions. This is one that I added. So this is because kind of we were, we were touching about the Baltimore and, you know, ACC connection. So, you know, and, and this is kind of just a quick question. What, what, from your perspectives, like one being, you know, local one being a visitor, what is Baltimore's cultural identity through like the lens of arts, the lens of making, the DIY, all of that stuff. But what is that cultural identity? Like when you think of Baltimore through your work and sort of ramping up for, for the marketplace, what comes to mind? Whenever I think about Baltimore arts, um, ever since, as I was saying, I, I moved here for school, it's just been a really um, like kind of grassroots kind of, do it yourself um kind of scene like no one no it's i i don't know how it was to live in like a soho loft in the 70s or whatever but everyone's just kind of living where they can and paying what they can and doing what they can um and it, the city is so kind of laid back and um it's so small and the scene is kind of um, kind of so interconnected that it really gives you space to um, grow and, and collaborate and play around and um, really get your footing without a whole lot of dire consequences. Um, <laughs> so I think that's, that's one of the things that makes it really special. It's really, it's really accessible. Yeah. Um, you can walk around every neighborhood and find art. Um, so, yeah. It's like a version yeah, of the exactly. zigzagging at the uh, marketplace. You oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> zigzagging all over the city to find things. <laughs> It's, it's fun because, again, as as you both know, my perspective is is that of an outsider, right? A visitor, um, you know. And I'm in a pretty great art city too. I, I live in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we also have, you know, just a really strong history and tradition of support for the arts uh, in all forms. I mean, people probably. I think maybe best know us for theater, um, and music, maybe, but we have a very strong visual arts and craft sector here too. So, you know, I feel like I come from an area where I, I, you know, I'm blessed with uh, a really rich scene, I guess, and community. But I, from the first time I visited Baltimore, and again, not just trying to curry favor with you as Baltimore residents, but like I knew <laughs> there was something special about this city. And I have, 
I have really relished the opportunity to return, not just for the for the marketplace, but to to take a couple of other trips back to Baltimore also, just for some relationship building and getting to know the city better. And I guess as I think about, you know, what comes to my mind, first of all, I'm very aware when I'm I'm in your city of the rich history. And and there's a lot more for me to learn about the history, but I see how the history creates a kind of a through line to the present, right? In making, you know, making related DIY, making of all kinds. It's not a surprise that that this is really a rich part of Baltimore's identity because it goes way back, right? There's a history and a tradition of different kinds of making. And I think you can see that, you know, just in the architecture, in the, you know, just the look and feel of the city and so there's a again a tradition that a lot of making I think emerges out of, and and that's just something I can feel um, being there. I also mm-hmm. find the just the community to be very um, hospitable, welcoming, hospitable. I, I feel like there's a warmth and a you know just I feel welcomed when I'm there as somebody who is interested in the arts, you know, wants to learn about the arts community. Um, people are very happy to talk about it. They are eager to share the community with, you know, with me and help me understand the great things that are going on. And it seems like also just a very grounded place, you know, not um, sometimes when when arts and culture are a big part of a city's identity, it, it can feel kind of off-putting, right? Like uh, alienating in some way or, or kind of overly, um, I don't know, I don't even know what the word is I want to use. It, like, like as if there's kind of a bubble, right? And if you're not in the bubble, then you're just, you're an outsider. And, and I, I feel the exact opposite. You know, I, I feel like from the minute you start talking to artists and makers in Baltimore, they want to embrace, you know, like you as a visitor, like I said, share what they're doing. Um, it, it just feels very warm and grounded and welcoming to me. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, both great answers. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of the last real question. This is more of the, you know, what's, what's, what's to look forward to at the marketplace? Like sort of those, those last moments, sort of like insights, what are you most excited about? What are you looking most forward to? I'm sure it might be, going there, being there, having it, you know, getting there. But um, share your thoughts on that. If we can, you know, start off, um, Andrea, if you will, um, start off there. Sure. Well, I mean, for me, it's a chance to reconnect with artists that I've talked to in in prior years, people I maybe do just get to see once a year. So I look forward to just walking through, walking around. Um, As Whitney said, I try to make it all the way through also the marketplace and try to, you know, see and talk to as many people as I can. So it's the reconnecting with people, meeting new people as well, um, seeing artwork that I get really excited about, you know, things that just seem really fresh and new to me. Um, This job is not easy on my pocketbook, as you can imagine, because like you, Rob, like I'm, I'm there, like I'm there to talk to people and to do my job, of course, but I'm also, I also try to actually, you know, add to my own uh, small C craft collection um, while I'm at the show. Uh, for me, you know, I mean, again, it it really does take our whole staff pretty much to produce this event. Everybody plays at least some role. And so we have a pretty, you know, pretty good contingent of ACCers there at the show. And it's it's really an amazing opportunity for us to work together in a different way and in a different setting. Um, the teamwork really comes to the fore, you know, as you can imagine, right? It's it's like our Super Bowl, right? It's ACC's Super Bowl. So for those of us who work, you know, day in and day out at the organization, it's a chance to spend that kind of time together and with artists, again, really be reminded of why we do what we do and I guess the last thing that I would say, and, and, you know, these are things that are more maybe personal to me. They're not, they're not necessarily the very same things that I think a person coming to the marketplace, you know, as appreciator would, would get excited about. But for me, it's instant feedback. Uh, And, you know, that is something a lot of us in our jobs, we don't get the opportunity to necessarily immediately get, you know, response from people about how something is going or what we're doing. And I don't know, you know, Whitney, if this um, resonates with you, but I was talking a couple days ago with another artist who has done our show in Baltimore, the marketplace for about six years. And she was talking about, you know, this event and other events. And she was saying that as an artist, it's, you know, the thing about 
experiences like this is that you get real time feedback from people. You see what they like Absolutely. in your work, you know, what they don't just by observing them. I mean, like whether you're talking with people or just observing them, you get a lot of information as an artist and that that is not necessarily true with other kinds of art, right. That you can do or other ways of presenting it or showing it, but in a marketplace environment like that, you get that like real time feedback. And that's true for us too, right? Like it's true for, for me and for my staff, you know, we, for our staff, I should say, like, we get real feedback, you know, real time feedback from artists and others as we're, as we're there at the show. And I, sometimes it's painful, but I look forward <laughs> to it. I look forward to it. And uh, we'll close on, on this portion before we get to the rapid fire with you, uh, Whitney, please. What are your thoughts? I mean, everything, everything that was said by Andrea. Um, also, I'm also as a, uh, as an exhibitor walking around buying art um, that maybe uh, maybe I I should I have a few things too many in my cart, <laughs> um, but I never regret it. I um, sometimes I overbuy, but I never regret it. Um, and I'm always before I was a participant, I always looked forward to the emerging artists section um, just because logistically their booth is is so is half the size of a regular size booth so i'm always like how's this person gonna like tell me who they are in a half size little space and they always they always do it up big they do it just as well as the full 10 by 10 space so i'm looking forward i always look forward to see how everyone's got everything set up what everyone's style is um because going from going from booth to booth is like visiting little different worlds, just like mm -hmm. a little peek into who that person is, what their what their style is, how they design things, um, which I always think is really interesting, and which always always corresponds to what they make. Like you see, you see the the font that they choose, you see the lighting, and you're like, this makes sense. <laughs> so it's that like kind of holistic. Um, just as a person who, I don't know, kind of loves, loves set design prop kind of stuff <laughs> as well to see how everybody's got everything set up. Maybe that's just a probably a really personal thing, but yeah. Thank you. No, I think it's, it's important. So <laughs> people are paying attention to, to these items. Like I, I go there to see someone set up and I was like, mm, all right, I guess. Or it's like, wow, you really maximize <laughs> this area. So yeah, you know, people are paying attention. Let's, um, okay. so, all right. So I got two last things They're They're, they're, they're housekeeping in my head in this podcast. This is my podcast. Uh, is, is housekeeping. It's, um, rapid fire It's indulgement. So please, please indulge me here. So, um, you know, the way that this works is don't overthink these questions. Just answer them as quickly as possible. Um, and from there, we'll close out with the sort of shameless plugs like that sort of last. All right. So here's the first thing, because I'm an active listener and you both enjoy baking. What are your favorite things to bake? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I really enjoy uh, making Japanese milk bread as of late. Um, okay. because it's, it's basically, I grew up on, on like squishy white wonder bread type bread. And, um, uh, it's basically that, but fresh and you can add, you can add matcha, you can add sesame paste, you can, you can really do it up. So it's kind of like, it's kind of a fancy grown wonder bread <laughs> and I really like making it. So, so, so Baltimore, right? I, I've never had this, this, this one, this, this Japanese style. You, you got my ears. I got headphones on, but you got my ears perked up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Okay. I'm going to, well, I, I was going to say I would second that, but that would mean that it's my favorite thing to make right now. I, I don't mean that. I just mean everything Whitney said about how good it is and how fun it is. That, that is very true. And it, it often has a fun shape too. It's often a, yeah. like a really square uh, shape loaf, which is kind of fun. So mm -hmm. I would say my answer, Rob, would be um, anything with a laminated dough because people freak out. It seems like it's this super fancy thing. I'll ex the laminated dough just me. It's like a croissant dough, basically, or a Danish pastry where you think like layers and layers and that's made with just butter and butter. I'll just say that. And it's fussy. It is fussy to make a little bit, but it's not as big of a deal as people think. 
they, they taste it or they see it. They're like, oh my God, how did you do that? You know, it, it's, the reaction is really fun for something that it, it just takes a little practice. It's not that big of a deal. Can, can I ask, sorry, can I ask, do you make, do you usually make a rough puff pastry or you make a full puff? I've done both, but I mean, the rough puff is so fun because the, the return on the investment of time, right. Is so yeah. great. Again, you get the have you get a big wow factor for not really not a that. lot of time. <laughs> yes. I feel that me too. Yeah. We're, we're going to have a, a spinoff podcast about baking all in all. <laughs> Cause, here, Cause here's the thing, you know, there have been times and I don't say this, this is not BS. I hang out at pastry shops sometimes. So I've seen folks like, mm. you know, Sacre Sucre and, you, you know, you know, you know, I used to just hang out. I'm like, oh, how many layers player? How many, yeah. oh, oh, Queen Amon. Okay. I see what you're doing. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know. I'm going to know. Yep. The, so if you've yeah. ever been to Cafe Dear Leon, I have. the egg, the egg sandwich, that's on milk bread. So oh. if you had that, you've had milk bread. Then yeah, the Tamago <laughs> egg. Yes. Yeah. So the egg. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Look, yes. you know, like, I'm a day removed from when I go back to adding carbs back into the diet. Usually during a week, <laughs> I can, the, the closest thing I can do, I'll think about a croissant or something, and then I gain, gain five pounds. So I just <laughs> not to do that until the weekends. Uh, here's the next one, and and again, this is this is sort of like whatever the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, preferred mode of communication: call, text, in person conversation. What do you prefer? In person conversation. Um, in person conversation, if I can, runner up is is call, always call. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say runner up is email. Email is good. Although it is the bane of my existence, and I get way too many of them. I'm responsible for that because I keep sending them out. So you know. <laughs> uh, so here's here's the next one. Um, however you deem work, because like uh, this isn't really work for me. This is more like play for me. Right. Um, because I get to make a fool of myself sometimes and ask people questions. Uh, what is your favorite time to work? Like when you're work work, when you're engaged, you're locked in, like some people are, Hey, I got to get everything knocked out. I'm up at 4am and I'm boogieing because I can get a lot of stuff done. And other people are more like night owls. When is your, your favorite time to work? 2pm. <laughs> very specific time i like it 2 p.m it's right after lunch and i feel like i'm i have all that energy because i'm not a morning person and i i can't do night anymore i'm gonna say 8, 8, 8 a.m so like not break of dawn but you know like before we're getting into kind of you know mid-morning so so i'm gonna say 8 8 a.m okay this is the last one uh, and, uh, be, because I'm always curious and we talked a little bit about, you know, food, you know, baked items, uh, so locally, right. So in, in the Baltimore space, what have you, you know, almost like thinking ahead a little bit, what is your like favorite spot to get a bite to eat, you know, from the local perspective and from a visitor's perspective, like, all right, like Andrew, you don't come to Baltimore all the time. So it's like, I need to get a crab cake from here. I need to get this from this place. Where's that, that place for you to grab a bite? Now you're like, this is going to hit. Well, I mean, I can you, can Whitney, can you go first on this one? <laughs> There's so many places. You just have like your Rolodex going right now. Cause that's how I feel. I'm like, what's, who can I shout out? I love so many places. Um, if I'm, if I'm going out and I'm, it's the middle of the day. I'm probably going to Good Neighbor in Hamden and I'm getting a matcha and whatever pastry they have if they have one. But if they don't, I'm just getting the biggest matcha they have because I'm a I'm a fool for milk. I love <laughs> I love big, a big milky tea. You referenced every place that I'd go to, which is really funny. It's like, Cafe oh, yeah. <laughs> good neighbor, all of the places. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm on a Cortado kick, so I'm definitely the Milky Rob, I guess. I, I don't like that name. I'm, I'm going to take that one, strike that one. Not Milky yeah, Rob, yeah. it's a word. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to um, maybe uh, save myself some some ribbing because instead of and I and I have to say also I don't think I have spent enough time in Baltimore and that is very unfortunate right to say that I have sampled many restaurants and I can tell you what is my favorite I'm going to instead say a couple of the places I have been to recently uh, that I have really enjoyed so this is like just places I've I've gone to 
uh, either the most recent trip or the one before that. Uh, it was introduced to a new bar called Dutch Courage when I was in town recently and had an amazing gin cocktail and also a little like a light bite, sort of a, an appetizer. It was delicious. And I'm seeing you nod, Whitney. So do you know this? Oh, yeah. Place? Yeah. Okay. So it's, that was really it's good. A, it's a gin bar. It's got all it's lots of types of gin drinks, all the gin drinks. Um, and then topside, I have really enjoyed the view up there and um, had some really good food there as well. And then finally, I had a chance to go to Gertrude's. After hearing about Gertrude's for yeah, you know yeah. a long time, I got to go there on my most recent trip, and that was really fun. It's wonderful. Yeah, don't, you, don't you feel like such a patron of the arts when you go to Gertrude's? For <laughs> sure. Like... It, it feels like you feel like you walked into a movie or something. Yeah, like yeah. In, into a time, into a kind of a time machine in a cool way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love it. And big shout out to Dutch Courage. They were early guests on this podcast. I, I, I went to their shop earlier um, when they, they first opened. That was definitely when everything was shut down, getting their like really creative cocktails like every week. And it doesn't hurt that they live like mm, their, their, uh, their, their, their shop is like uh, the restaurant bar, gin bar, the whole setup is uh, two blocks away from my partner's place. So I just walk down there, get a bottle. It used to come in a little medicine-like bottle. So I was like, yeah, I need my medicine. What is that? Oh, it's dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of it for the, the 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 podcast. So there's two things I want to do. One, I want to thank you both for coming on and, and sharing and just, you know, enjoying this 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 afternoon with me. And, and two, I want to invite and encourage both of you um, in these final moments to plug away social media, websites, all of that good stuff, sort of tell folks, you know, sort of those last details about the uh, marketplace and um, the floor is yours. So please. Yeah, I'm um, at Personal Best Ceramics on Instagram. Uh, I don't do any of the other ones. So it's it's just Instagram and then personalbestceramics.com. And I will be... Um, I'll be at the marketplace at the emerging artist section. Okay. So I, of course, I'm going to plug craftcouncil.org. Um, that is the website of the American craft council and you can find all of our social there too. Um, but craftcouncil.org is the place to go to get tickets to the Baltimore marketplace. You can get them at the door as well. I want to make sure people know that, but there's an, a little discount for you if you get them ahead of time. So I do recommend you know you're going to go, which of course you do. Uh, you could go to our website, get your ticket ahead of time and get a little discount. And you can also find out uh, there on the website about how to become a member of the Craft Council as well. And since we're in the shameless plug section, something we haven't talked about much at all um, uh, during the podcast is the fact that we publish this beautiful magazine that is a quarterly magazine. And this is the a great benefit of being a member. So that's my final word. Go to craft, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, craftcouncil.org, please. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Andrea Speck from the American Craft Council and artist Whitney Simpkins for coming on and talking a bit about craft and the American Craft Made Baltimore Marketplace. Hope to see you there. <laughs>